Hello my pretties and welcome back. So as we know, October is the month of Halloween, but it's also Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So I thought that instead of doing a video about a serial killer or something like that, we will be looking at a different kind of monster, the domestic abuser, and telling the full stories of Maya Moliete and Gabby Petito, who were both victims of domestic violence and ultimately homicide. You probably already know these stories and you've watched videos, maybe even my videos, but if you didn't, that's okay. I'm just going to run through the full stories because at the moment they're quite disjointed with different videos, so I just want to put them all together. So let's start with Maya. She was born on May the 1st, 1981, and her family is originally from the Philippines. When she was younger, she lived for some time with her family in Hawaii. In 1999, when she was 18, she got married to her high school sweetheart, and his name is Larry. And Larry, at this point, already showed signs of being a violent person. When he was a teenager, he, what, he was arrested because he actually stabbed someone, another boy, who thankfully recovered. But this was all part of a gang-related activity, I believe. He then enlisted in the U.S. Navy. Do they let people with criminal records enlist in the military? I don't know. It seems interesting to me, but obviously they do. So anyway, he enlisted in the U.S. Navy and he was serving in the Navy in some or other form until 2008. And he was stationed in San Diego at some point. So the family moved there and then settled in Chula Vista in California. So Maya basically moved to join him there. In 2010, Maya gave birth to their first child, a little girl, and their other two children, another girl and then a boy, were born in 2011 and 2016. Maya was working as a contract specialist in the naval base in San Diego, and she was really good at her job, but she was also very committed to her kids, and she was very, very close with her family. She had a lot of friends and hobbies, like belonging to a jeep club or playing music. She was very talented. But her life at home was far from perfect. Larry was controlling, jealous, and violent. Maya had confided in a friend that he had once choked her till she passed out. He would also contact her supervisor and ask that she not work close to other men. He was convinced she was having an affair. And as their relationship deteriorated in 2020, Larry's behavior turned even darker. He started Googling, my wife doesn't want me to touch her, and then Googled Rohypnol. You know, Rohypnol, the date rape drug. He then started contacting people who practice witchcraft. And this is quite common in the Philippines. Uh, Catholicism and witchcraft kind of coexist within the same belief system. But he was trying to weaponize this and was paying people to put spells and hexes on Maya to not leave him. Eventually, he started asking them to hex her so that she would be injured, like her bones broken or something, to the point where she would need his full-time care and couldn't leave him. So sick. It's so sick. So twisted. He's such a piece of shit. He then started looking up plants that can poison people, like hemlock. And while he's busy researching this and having his evil ideas, he's sending Maya all these Bible verses and appealing to her family members to basically talk her into staying with him and basically pretending to be all pious and a good Christian and all of that. He was also sending her articles like what men want from their wives. And she rightly called him out on it, saying that he took no responsibility for the breakdown of their marriage and that he thought she was the problem and that she needed to be fixed and then everything would be okay. And she was 100% correct on that. I mean, who wants to be married to that? I'm not, a, I'm not a therapist or anything, but I'm pretty sure that what wives want from their husbands is not to be stalked and choked until they lose consciousness. Just a guess. 
In the meantime, Maya was basically done with him and all his crap, and she was determined to divorce him. They were sleeping in separate bedrooms and they were fighting all the time, even about small things like who got to drive the Jeep on vacation. There was no more love there. Maya was afraid of him. She told her family that if something happened to her, it would be Larry. And Larry told someone close to him that he wanted to kill Maya and her supposed boyfriend, but that he would have to plan it very well. And he also looked into hiring a contract killer, and he was very serious about it, apparently. And unfortunately, Maya wasn't aware of any of this. So on 7th of January 2021, she called a divorce attorney. And she texted a friend saying that she was going to file for divorce and she was tired of trying to make it amicable for the kid's sake. That same day, Larry texted his boss saying that the marriage was over and that he was about to snap. That night, Maya had a chat with her family, I think on Facebook Messenger, um, as she often did. And then nobody heard from her again. That night, security footage captured the sounds of what could be gunshots, but it's not confirmed, and their three kids playing outside after 10pm that night, which was unusual, obviously. Just before the gunshots, Larry had taken a screenshot of his cryptocurrency account and sent it to his daughters. So that makes me wonder if he was planning on killing himself too, And this was kind of his plan to make sure his kids could access the money, but then he changed his mind. The next day, early in the morning, just before 6am, Larry was captured on CCTV backing their black Lexus SUV into his garage. So learning from Chris Watts, I'm sure. Shortly afterward, he left and he took his four-year-old son with him, but left his phone behind so he couldn't be traced. The car is also older, so the tracking technology in it is not that advanced, so it was impossible to pinpoint exactly where he went, but he was gone for 11 hours. His boss was trying to get hold of him because he hadn't called in sick. And at that point, his dad was also trying to get hold of him because he had heard from his boss that he hadn't gone in. After everything, he told people that he had gone to the beach that day. Authorities have determined that there was a navigation event on the car's GPS system. So that means that he put in the coordinates to go home at that point. And it was two and a half hours before he arrived back at his home. So after not being able to get hold of Maya, even after attempting to call her and visit her, her family got understandably worried. And she had missed her daughter's birthday, so they knew something was very, very wrong. Her sister reported her missing on the 9th of January. Larry was determined to make it seem like Maya had left him voluntarily. He claimed that perhaps she had gone wine tasting. And at that point, Larry's aunt and uncle had been to his house and removed a freezer from the home. This makes me wonder, this is speculation on my part, but I can't get it out of my head. Was Maya forced to climb into the freezer and then shot to limit the blood splatter in the mess and her body then moved? I don't know. Larry deleted all text messages between him and Maya and later told detectives it was to save space on his phone. Sure, dude. Seems legit. Search warrants were then served and the home was searched. And the family went out with search parties, Maya's family, went out with search parties every weekend to try and find Maya. Larry never joined these. And the kids stayed with Larry and his parents in the home Larry and Maya shared. At one point, most of Larry's 22 guns were confiscated, or rather he was actually ordered to turn them in. But there was one gun missing, and it's still missing. Nine months went by without many updates. Maya's family continued their searches for her. And then on the 18th of October, Maya's kids were interviewed by police again. And Larry started withdrawing large amounts of cash from their bank account. Probably getting ready to run, stupid coward. But he was then arrested on 19th of October at his home. His children remain in the home with his parents for the time being. 
And I know this upsets a lot of people and they feel that the, his family shouldn't be taking care of the kids. But we have to be reasonable here. His parents have not been charged with any crime. They're not under investigation as far as we know. And this situation is familiar to the children at this point. This is their routine now. Since their grandparents have been staying with, the, with them for months already. So this is technically better for them because they're not being disrupted as much. Larry has pled not guilty to the charge of murder and Maya's body has still not been found. And her family are understandably desperate to find her and to lay her to rest and to get some closure. So they're asking the public, if you saw a black Lexus SUV pulled over to the side of the road on 8th of January or doing anything suspicious, call the police and please let them know. I have absolutely no proof for what I'm about to say. It's just, it's a niggling thought that I've had for months. I keep thinking about all the abandoned mines, the gold mines at Joshua Tree National Park. There are more than 300 of them out there. And we know that Larry does follow true crime to some degree and that he's seen to learn from Chris Watts' mistakes. There are a few high profile cases such as the Josh Powell and Aaron Corwin cases where abandoned mines were either used or suspected as a site of the body disposal. Now, many of these mines you would have to hike to get to, which would be pretty hard with a dead body and a four-year-old in tow. But there are some, for example, along a road called the Old Dale Road, where you can actually see some of the mines from the road. That's how close they are. The terrain is quite rough, but it's manageable with a 4x4 vehicle. And how far away is this from Chula Vista? Without much traffic, two and a half hours. And this was in January, so there were still lockdowns, so possibly not as much traffic and not as much tourism to areas like Joshua Tree. So it's worth a shot, maybe. Um, his tire pressure was also reportedly low, which could mean that he was driving either on sand or on rocky terrain. I really wonder if they're going to offer him a plea deal if he tells them where Maya is, but something tells me that this narcissistic asshole is not going to give up that information very easily. And now for Gabby's story. Gabby Petito was 22 years old and she was originally from New York where she grew up and also where she met the man who would become her future fiance, 23 year old Brian Laundry. So like Maya, she was also very young and was going to marry basically her high school sweetheart. And just as Maya moved to San Diego with Larry, Gabby ended up moving to Florida to live with Brian and his family. And this was isolating to Gabby in more ways than one. Not only was she far away from her family and friends, but according to one of the very few friends she allegedly had in Florida, Brian was very controlling and attempted to stop her from contacting friends if he didn't like them or approve of their relationship. This is a major red flag and also the second similarity between her story and Maya's. A person who tries to control who you see or who you work with is already ramping up their emotional abuse and has the potential to turn violent. Gabby was very into health and wellness and also really loved traveling. So in July 2021, she set off with Brian on a cross-country road trip in a converted white van. They were vlogging about this trip and posting on Instagram. I think the hope was to build a following and eventually earn a living as a travel influencer. But the close quarters and being together all the time seemed to put a massive strain on the relationship. Which may have also been the case for Maya during 2020 when everyone was in quarantine. Being isolated with your abuser can definitely result in an increase in abuse and also an increased danger for the victim of the abuse. It was later reported that Brian was seen acting aggressively towards staff in a restaurant and that Gabby seemed very distraught. And on the 12th of August, police in Utah were called out to an incident where a 911 caller reported a physical altercation between the couple. Reportedly, the caller described seeing Brian slap Gabby. 
So like in the case with Maya, there were incidents of physical assaults before the murder. Well, I have to say alleged murder because it hasn't been confirmed that uh, Brian murdered Gabby. I think that's just the assumption that's kind of going around. So I just have to say that. The police ended up pulling the couple over and interviewing them separately. And Gabby was visibly upset. You can see it in the videos. She was crying uncontrollably. Brian was a lot calmer and he said that Gabby had hit him. But when they asked Gabby if Brian had assaulted her, she said no. The police then separated them for the evening. And Gabby last contacted her family at the end of August, the 25th of August to be precise, and reportedly told her mom that there was strain in the relationship. And then nobody heard from her again. Brian returned to Florida on September the 1st in the white van with Gabby nowhere to be found. His family immediately retained an attorney and he wouldn't give Gabby's family or the authorities any information about where Gabby was or what had happened to her. So Gabby's family filed a missing persons report and this is just like in the Maya case. The partner was not the one alerting the authorities, the family did. On the 19th of September, the authorities announced that a body had been found in a remote campsite in Wyoming, and testing determined that this was sadly, in fact, Gabby's body. And later autopsy reports confirmed that she had been strangled to death manually, which means that she was strangled to death by someone using their bare hands. But in the meantime, Brian had disappeared. His parents said that he had gone missing on the 17th of September after going hiking at a nearby nature reserve in Florida. He had been seen by neighbors going on a camping trip with his parents days after he returned without Gabby, and now he was missing. A nationwide manhunt was launched, and lots of reported sightings of Brian came in from all over the country. Authorities combed through the reserve where he was supposedly hiking, but nothing was found. And then on October the 20th, Brian's parents alerted authorities to their plan to go search for Brian at a different nature reserve, which is adjacent to the original nature reserve. And it's at this reserve that Brian's notebook, backpack, and skeletonized remains were found. It's not clear yet what the cause of death is. Um, I think the autopsy was inconclusive, but I think it's probably assumed that it's suicide and his parents have confirmed that he will be cremated. There have been some wild conspiracy theories. Um, So some of them include that Brian's parents murdered him and planted his body and the other items, but this is ridiculous because cops have been swarming all over their house. So it's not like they could hide his body there. And there have been protesters in front of their home basically 24-7. So if they snuck out, someone would have seen it. Plus, why would they kill him? Sorry, but that's just stupid. And another stupid theory is that he's not really dead. And they just extracted his teeth and implanted the teeth in the skull of a homeless, unclaimed man and then left his body there for the authorities to be fooled. And this is also a stupid theory. Why? Because it's not possible to take teeth out and implant them in another person's skull without noticing. You actually have to drill and put them in, and that would be noticed by the medical practitioner conducting the autopsy. So this is really dumb. Some people think that his parents knew where he was all along, and that they stopped hearing from him and that's why they got worried and then suggested that they go search there. But news reports are saying that his parents have actually suggested this as a potential site to search um, to authorities from the very beginning. So if they were involved in some capacity, we don't know and there's no real evidence of that right now. So I'm sure the cops are on it. So I think just let the cops do their job Um, if you're camping out in front of their house, please stop. You're not achieving anything by doing that. And you may not like them and that's valid. I think, um, they're very unpopular at the moment. I'm also not their biggest fan, but they are also grieving. Their son is dead. So just leave them alone. Okay. 
If you're in the Florida area and you want to help with another missing woman's case, Nomi Bolivar is still missing. I will leave a link to the video I did about that. Um, and her parents could really use some help in locating her and her case hasn't got that much media attention. So maybe you can refocus some of your kind of rage and um, your activism in that direction. I think that would be very helpful. And I also want to highlight another case that might also not be domestic violence related, but it hasn't got gotten as much media attention. And that is the disappearance of a Native American woman named Mary Johnson. She lived in Marysville in Washington, and she went missing on November the 25th, 2020. So she's been missing for almost a year now. And November the 24th, a day before she was last seen, her estranged husband dropped her off with uh, her suitcase at a friend's house. And the next day she was planning on visiting friends in Oso, which was 30 miles away. And the friend she was staying with um, for the night was supposed to give her a ride to a nearby church. And then at the church, someone was supposed to pick her up and then take her to her friend's house. Um, and another man was also supposed to get a lift to the church, but something happened and Mary and the other man needing the lift ended up walking to the church. And then the person who was supposed to drive her to her friend's house in Oso, I think it's pronounced Oso. Um, anyway, he also ended up driving off without her because he didn't have enough room in his car. And he said that he saw her with this, the other man that she had walked to the church with. She never made it to her friend's house and they received a panicked voicemail from her asking them to pick her up and she still has not been found. Sadly, she is one of many indigenous women who have gone missing or been murdered with very little media coverage. If you or someone you know is in a violent or abusive relationship, we know that there are high risk situations when the person is more likely to murder their partner. And one such triggering event is in the event of a divorce or a breakup. So I will link a resource down below to set out an escape plan for how to get away from the person as safely as possible. And I'll also link some hotlines to call for help or for further advice. Please know that you are not alone and you can and should reach out for help. That's all for today. I hope you have a great day. See you soon. Bye.